Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with everybody again this month. Uh, the way things are going, we have to appreciate every day. So uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this morning, um, who is a fabulous writer. Um, he writes fiction, he writes nonfiction, he writes everything. And um, I have read several of his nonfiction books on character and also one of my, I think my favorite uh, fiction books, which is The Long Lost Letters of Doc Holliday, um, which David and I went, went into in depth uh, a year or so ago. Uh, so I highly recommend uh, if you love Doc Holliday and you want to learn something and have a great experience, buy that book. But anyway, um, so um, David is also the author of six novels, uh, six, five other novels, including um, uh, well, we said that, The Long Lost Letters of Doc Holliday. His short fiction and poetry have appeared in a broad array of magazines and anthologies, with pieces twice selected for Best American Mystery Series, and his nonfiction has appeared in numerous venues, including the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Chronicle Narrative. I'm not going to say that one, Dave, because it has too many vowels in it. Z-Y-Z-Z-Y-V-A. Zizuba. Yeah, that one. Zizuba. Movie maker, the writer, and Writer's Digest, where he is a contributing editor. A sought after speaker, David has taught through the UCLA Extension Writer, Extensions Writers Program, Book Passage, Lit Reactor, A26 Valencia, The Grotto in San Francisco, and numerous other writing conferences across the US, Canada, and Mexico. His textbook, The Art of Character, was published by Penguin, and Writer's Digest published his follow up, The Compass of Character, in October 2019. And I am so um, pleased and honored to welcome David to our group this morning. Thanks, Maddie. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, taken from the second writing guide, the, the Compass of Character, which focuses largely on motivation. And the reason I'm going to talk about motivation is because that's what I thought I was going to be talking about. Yes, so I, that I works. The title of my talk on the website yesterday and realized compelling emotional character development, which if I was going to have only 45 minutes, that's sort of like putting 10 pounds of sugar into a two pound bag. So um, instead, I'm going to focus on motivation. And the thing is, the word motivation itself is a little intimidating, mainly because like many nouns that end with I-O-N, it's an abstraction of a verb. So whenever, what you're really thinking about motivation is what, what motivates, what urges my character to act. And the way to understand that is to understand that there's three levels of struggle that your character is going to be going through in your story. There's the exterior, which is usually the easiest to identify. That's um, you know, save the miners, that's catch the killer, that's marry the loved one, uh, that's seek revenge against the person who wronged you. That's the exterior goal. But there's two other struggles and one is interior and one is interpersonal. Interior struggles usually involve some, something that addresses the character's sense of identity, the sense of integrity, authenticity, um, purpose, meaning, uh, their place in the universe, their reason for being. And stories that address something of that nature almost always resonate really deeply with readers, you know, because they, they ask that really fundamental question, why am I here? Why am I doing this? And their personal uh, struggles have to do with a relationship within the story. And those also uh, inspire empathy in the character and allow for greater connection between the reader and the character, because we care about people who care about others. So these two other elements, the internal and the interpersonal, are key to providing depth to the character, but also for understanding the key question that you have to answer when you're trying to figure out why your character is doing what they're doing. And that's the, the question of motivation. The exterior tells us what they're trying to do, but how to answer the question why, why are they doing it? And particularly when things get difficult, when the struggles get hard, when it, the, the time comes when they're asking themselves, why am I doing this? Why keep going? Why is it so important? It's almost always going to reflect either something that speaks to identity, their sense of purpose, their sense of meaning, their sense of self-worth, 
or it's going to involve a relationship that either they at the beginning of the story was already valuable or which they have discovered about is valuable in the course of the story or which has become more valuable through the course of the story and they realize that surrendering that relationship or surrendering this sense of identity would be so devastating that if they didn't continue trying to accomplish the exterior goal, it would rupture something fundamental about their sense of who they are or this relationship they consider to be invaluable. So whenever you're trying to think, answer that question, why is my character doing what they're doing? Look to how does it affect how they view themselves and their sense of worth and their sense of meaning? Or how does it affect a relationship they consider indispensable to their life or both. Very often our sense of identity is very tied up in, in who we believe is valuable in our lives. Those of you in a, in, in a relationship and a marriage, especially one of many years, it, you realize that one of the great things that changes in your life when you meet that special person is that for the, you find out a sense of, of yourself that is truly different than it was before when you were single and alone. That you feel as though you have found the person you're meant to be with. And if your character doesn't have somebody in their life like that, you might wanna consider having them search for or find that person in the course of their story. Because that's always something that one, readers connect with very profoundly. Two, is intrinsically human. It's the rare person who truly believes that they can live you know, on an island. And three, it adds depth to your characterization and helps you answer that key question of motivation. Why is my character doing what they're doing? Why are they pursuing this goal? Why is it so valuable to them and meaningful to them? Okay, so that's just a basic outline of when you're trying to think about motivation, what do I think about? And it's one, that key question, why is my character doing what they're doing? And it's almost always rooted in a sense of identity, or a sense of a relationship that they consider valuable. Now I'm gonna add a little side note here. When I gave this talk uh, to another group of writers, uh, there was a woman who was writing what she called transgressive literature, where the characters are, she says like, I write about lovable sociopaths. And she goes, and, and the setup that I'm about to go through, she goes, it sounds kind of conservative and normal and conventional. And you know, my characters, you know, they're, they're not doing anything out of, out of the sense of, of, of positivity. They're doing it out of the sense of transgression. And it was a new question for me. And I, I'm not sure I fielded it as well as I might have, but, but I thought about it a lot after the, the class was over. And I, I approached the question, I mean, I, I answered a, a little bit in that session, but as I thought about it more, why does a, a transgressive character go against convention? Why does anybody violate moral rules that, are, that other people abide by or other conventions that might seem normal? And again, the, the issue there is authenticity. They believe that by doing the conventional, they somehow been trapped in a conformist mindset that they feel is a kind of prison. Even transgressive characters are seeking something that I'm going to be calling a dream of life that there is a better way of being, and for them, a more authentic way of being than what they're living presently, and that's what they're striving for. And even lo lovable sociopaths, you know, have that as an intrinsic sense of worth and meaning that they're pursuing. Okay, now, to lay out what I do when I start working with a character, are there's four elements that I, uh, I look at, and these are lack, yearning, resistance and desire. Now, the difference between yearning and desire is one of depth. Desire goes to the, what I call that external goal of the story. What is the character trying to achieve in the real world of the story you've created? Again, you know, rescue the miners, find the killer, marry the loved one, that's the external goal. And that's the desire. Under that is going to be the yearning. And I'm going to go talk about that in some depth now. That's a deeper need or longing for something truly meaningful and what I'll call their dream of life. Okay, and I'm going to go back over all four again and talk about them in a little more depth. Lack. Something is missing from your character's life. 
something meaningful. They have a sense of incompleteness. And if you reflect on this, and a lot of this can really be brought home if you ask these questions of yourself. The answers may be a little unsettling. You might find that um, you become a little uneasy as you begin to ask these questions of yourself, but that's okay. In fact, it's probably even helpful. It's gonna help you connect with your characters because they also are gonna feel that uneasiness. The sense of lack. Heidegger wants to find existential guilt as it, the awareness of everything we are not. In Christianity, Augustine talked about how we have this fundamental sense of incompleteness because we're still yearning for the divine connection we knew in the Garden of Eden and which has been deprived of us because of original sin and that only grace can return to us. In Buddhism, there's a sense of a, a anxiety over the sense of no self, that there is no self, there is no key identity. And because that scares us, we constantly try to root ourselves in the real world through power, through lust, through gratification of, 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 of the senses. And that, that's as in Buddhism that the metaphor is, it's like trying to slake your thirst with salt water. In every philosophical and religious tradition, there is this sense of we are not yet complete. We are striving for something. And that sense of incompleteness is what I call lack. And in, and in your stories, your character will be feeling this in some way at the beginning of the story. This, this, the exception is if you begin the story with a contented character, a character whose life is going fine. And something then in your story is going to disrupt that sense of peace and tranquility and security. And they're gonna be trying to regain that sense of peace and tranquility and security through the course of your story. And it may be at the end, they do get it again, or they're so transformed that their sense of security and peace and tranquility is fundamentally transformed. Uh, Frodo and Lord of the Rings is a classic example. In the beginning, he lives in Middle Earth and he's very happy, he's very contented with his life. But then the journey begins. And at the end of that journey, he comes back to Middle Earth, but realizes he no longer belongs there. That what he's seen and what he's endured and what he's experienced fundamentally transform his notion of who he is and what he should do. And so instead he goes off with the elves on another journey. So that sense of, if you do have a character who, whose life is, seems complete and seems good at the beginning of your story, the, 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 the struggle of the story is either going to be to return to that if they can, or it may change them fundamentally. So their idea of what is completeness and peace and tranquility is fundamentally changed. But for most characters, there's going to be a hunger. There's going to be a longing for something that they may not even know what it is. They just know that things aren't right. And it may be experienced in they've settled for second best. It may be that there's a sort of an anxiety, a sense of despondency, a sense of lethargy, a sense of, of, of wanting something more and they don't know what it is and they don't know how to get it. And this is how most characters begin their stories. So identifying how your character feels that lack, and it is a, it's, it's an emotional state. It's a state of being. And try to you know, picture them in that. How do, how do they express their sense of not being everything they could be? Now, a, a lot of people deal with that with a certain sense of denial. No, things are fine. Things are okay. Things are the best they could possibly be given the life I've lived. And a lot of us sort of manage our lives that way. You know, things aren't great, but I'm, I'm working toward them getting better and, and, and I'm fundamentally okay. Um, your story is going to rupture that in a major way if it's going to be meaningful in a really deep way. But that's, that's how most of us deal with it. A certain sense of, of suppression of that anxiety, a certain sense of denial, because if we really look at how incomplete our lives are, it's a little terrifying. It's scary to look at our lives and, and, and realize, you know, I'm not who I thought I was going to be. My life isn't what I had hoped it would be. Now what am I gonna do? And this leads us to the next thing, which is the yearning. Now I just, I just violated my own rule here. I called it the yearning. And I, let's take that the away. I don't want it to be a noun. I want it to be thought of more as a verb. It is a longing. It is a sense of, 
I have a dream of life toward which I want to struggle. It's a sense of uh, the promise of life, the kind of person I want to be and the way of life I want to live. You know, do I want to live on an island by myself? Do I want to live far away from people on a hilltop? Do I want to live in the middle of a big city, in the middle of all of that activity and everything going on? What speaks to my sense of identity? Which way of life do I want to live? And how do I want to be? Do I, you know, how do I picture myself behaving in that world? Who's part of that world? Do I have a family or do I just have my, myself and my friends? Or do I have a marriage but no children? Do I have a huge family? Do I have just a couple kids? Do I have pets? You know, who, you know what, what is that world that I, that I envision as making me as happy as I have any reason to be? That's my dream of life. And the yearning speaks that the longing to get there. And I may not know the way. Your story is going to provide some way some path toward at least getting closer to it. Well, then let's ask the fundamental question. We know the character's in a state of incompleteness. We know there's this underlying longing, this hunger for something more, you know, living the dream of life that they have within themselves, even if they don't fully if conceptualize it. For the sake of, of, of your writing, you're probably going to want to try to visualize in some way or conceptualize what that yearning is. Now, I have a tendency to resist putting a word to it because a word can often diminish it. It's sort of like in, in the Jewish tradition, uh, they, the word Yahweh in the actual Hebrew does not have any vowels because it's not supposed to be pronounced. And you know, uh, there's a great story about this uh, by, by Borges or the, you know, the first letter of the name has been spoken. And it's sort of like what they're saying is that this name was never supposed to be spoken, which is supposed to evoke that sense of awe. That words, and it's like the, the Tao that is true cannot be spoken. In, in many religious traditions, the whole sense of the divine, what is truly meaningful, can't be expressed in words. It has to be felt. It has to be experienced in an intuitive way. And sometimes I use a piece of music to tap into what I think my character's yearning is about, because I'm, I'm just very musical and I'm very, and music affects me in a very personal and intuitive way. An example of how I use this um, in two different characters. I had a 16 year old girl living on the street. She had been abducted when she was six years old uh, because she physically resembled another girl who had been abducted six weeks before. The same guy picked up both girls. She managed to escape but she came from a very rough family. And it very quickly became apparent to her that the community sort of where she'd been the other girl who'd survived and not her. And she had to endure that and live with that and realize that she was the one who should have died. And it really messes with her head. And when she's 16, she's living on the street. She's working the street. She's trying to get out of a, a, a serious problem with drugs. She was turning tricks as a teenager. She's trying to turn that around. So. I could pick music that typifies who she is, but that's not the point. I'm trying to pick a piece of music that expresses where she wants to go. And what I did is I picked uh, Ray Fawn Williams, The Lark Ascending. I don't know if, if you know the piece. It's incredibly beautiful and it's, it's premised on the image of a lark rising from the water. And it was Ray Fawn Williams' way of, of conceptualizing the ascent of the soul after death. And so there's a, there's a sort of darkness to it, but there's a beauty to it. And it's an incredibly peaceful and, and inspirational piece of music. And for me, that really tapped into Jackie, her name was Jacqueline, into Jackie's sense of where she wanted to go, not just physically, because her, her physical dream is to go to a little village in Mexico where nobody knows her, get a job in a hotel, and just live the life that she believes she deserves, rather than the life that everybody else thinks she deserves. But to give me the emotional context of that, I use this piece of music. So if, if, if you're moved by paintings or images, use that. I like music. Um, if, if words like home or freedom you know, resonate for you in a very emotional way, fine. I find that they have a tendency to be a little limiting. So whenever I'm trying to conceive that the, the character's yearning, I not only want to, picture who they want to be 
and how or where they want to live. But for the emotional substrate, I usually pick a piece of music so that every time I begin writing a scene with that character, I hear that music in, in my head. I feel it in my heart and I connect with the character in that way. So yearning, dream of life, a sense of the promise of life, the deep longing for the kind of person they want to be and the way of life they want to live. Now here's the question. Why don't they have it already? What's holding them back? And this is the next thing. I mentioned lack, yearning. The next thing is resistance. And those of you who've ever read The War of Art, which is a wonderful little book about being an artist, resistance is the enemy. Resistance is the thing that keeps us being creative. Resistance is the thing that keeps us from putting our butt in the chair and writing you know, how many hours a day. Resistance is the thing, the excuse we always find for not being who we are or what we want to do. It's in, meant in the same way here, except not just in terms of creativity, but in terms of being who we want to be and living how we want to live. And I break it down into several subcategories. The first is weakness. And this is something very often we're just born with. It's an inclination toward a type of behavior or, or type of viewing the world, which limits us. I've mentioned some in my handout, laziness, cowardice, lack of confidence, cynicism, despair. Now, just, just thinking of those alone, you'll realize, well, they don't necessarily just come out of my nature. Very often experience can, can bring those about as well. And that's true. These things are not necessarily isolated. There'll be other things that the character experiences that may exacerbate or accentuate uh, those inclinations. But if you're you know, one way of looking at what's holding your character back is to ask, do they have any of these inclinations that would naturally keep them or hold them back from pursuing their, their sense of purpose, their sense of meaning, their sense of true value? In some sense, they're all connected to a sense of fear. So tapping into their fear, which we'll get into a little bit more in just a little bit, uh, is, is always a great way to begin exploring that. The next one is wounds. Has the character suffered some great wound, some um, trauma that has profoundly affected their sense that either they're capable of pursuing what they want or that it's worthwhile in the larger view? Those of you who've ever you know, lost a loved one, especially a child or a spouse or a sibling or a parent to whom you were profoundly connected, you know that in the, that, that those first months, maybe even years of grief, there's a sense of meaninglessness. There's a sense of, well, if this most important thing in my life can be taken away so suddenly, so egregiously, so painfully, and especially if you've watched someone you love suffer from cancer or some other terrible disease, there's always this profound sense of, well, then why does it matter? If I can strive for everything I want and have it end up like that, What's the point? So wounds can be profoundly useful in characterization and identifying what has kept my character, held them back from pursuing the most important thing in their life. Has they, have they suffered some great loss that has made them doubt themselves or doubt the world and the meaning of the world and the meaning of their life? Um, a great, uh, another great example, those of you, I, I'm, use old, I use old movies because I figured that almost everybody's always seen an old movie. And Casablanca is a great example. Rick Blaine, the Bogart character, you know, found the love of his life. Ilsa uh, Lund from Norway felt profoundly in love. It was the one thing that was going to be worthwhile now that the, the, the wolves were chasing him. You know, they were going to go away. They were going to have a great life together. But then she leaves him alone there on the train station in the rain with a letter saying, you know, I can't explain. I'm just, I'm not coming. And he becomes bitter. And he becomes cynical as you, in the beginning of the movie, even though his employees love him. And that's really interesting. We realize he's not a bad guy, but the way he treats strangers or other people is incredibly cruel and selfish. And he says, I stick my neck out for nobody. And we're fascinated by what explains this contradiction. How can he be so loved by employees? Because, you know, he takes care of them and yet be so cruel and indifferent to others. What happened? And that question is what hangs us on that character through the first half of the story. And like most stories, it gets explained in the middle of the story. That's where their backstory is presented. 
Okay, so wounds. The next one is limitations. I, I came across this when somebody said, I'm, I'm, writing, I'm writing a YA novel. My character is like seven years old. She hasn't had some profound wound yet. And, you know, and saying that she's cynical or despondent or, or lazy is kind of, you know, it's kind of roughing her up at a very early age. And, and well, youth itself can hold you back. I don't know, I'm, I'm sure all of you remember when you were told you're too young to, whatever it was, you know, you, you're, you're not strong enough, your body's not strong enough, your mind's not developed enough, you don't have a sense of the world enough, you don't have enough, you know, the ethical grounding to be able to, but when you finally become, and there's always an age, I remember my parents always said, it's always gonna be better in high school. And when high school sucked, they said, well, it's gonna be better in college. And luckily it did get a little better in college, <laughs> but high school was not that much better than grade school because um, there were still nuns. Um, but that's, that's another story. So limitations, youth, old age. Sometimes, you know, that, that time has passed when you have the physical or the mental capacity to pursue that way of life. It's past you. But if your story has someone at an old age, there's still going to be something they want. There's still going to be something of value. But that limitation is going to, is going to hold them back just as it's held them back before. Inexperience, that's a limitation. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I never, I don't know what to do here. I've never, this has never happened to me before. Um, bad health is another limitation. Somebody with, with uh, tuberculosis like Doc Holliday, there were things that, you know, that he had difficulty doing simply because he just simply didn't have the health to be able to accomplish them. It also accounted for his meanness in a lot of ways. There's, um, in fact, Chopin experienced this. He also was tubercular. And um, it's, it's called the um, consumptive uh, choleric temperament, that people who are suffering from tuberculosis could become perversely mean-spirited and, and, and angry and cruel, seemingly at the, at the drop of a hat. And it was just part of their physical condition. Well, that's obviously going to inhibit them from having meaningful relationships with people that they love. So that alone can account for it. So has your character's health in some way held them back? Another is what I call opposition. What I mean by this, in your story, there's going to be you know, conflict from other people. This is more conflict in the past that has affected how the character views who they are and how, and how they can live and what they can be. For example, a condemning or overbearing father, someone who said, you're never going to be anything. That happened to my dad. Um, his father said he was never going to be anything except a garage mechanic. And that motivated him to become an executive. Um, a over forgiving parent, someone who just says, well, everything you do is great. Well, that's not going to prepare you for struggle. You're going to find that when things get tough, no, I'm wonderful. I should be just, I, you know, if it's hard, it's not right. Well, what are you going to accomplish that kind of mindset? But if you've had a parent who was constantly telling you that you were wonderful, you may very well suffer from that limitation. From that, that sense of that, uh, that, that, that parental effect is going to inhibit your sense of what you can accomplish and why. Um, other things, a snobbish society, um, friends who, are, uh, who, who have a diminished sense of, of what life is. You develop an ambition. You want to get out. They want to remain the way they, uh, they are, and they want you to stay with them. Classic character of this is Jesse in Breaking Bad. Once, he, you know, once his, his, his girlfriend dies of an overdose, he gets clean. He wants to move beyond the scene. But both Walt and his friends, his hangers-on, want him to stay in the scene because the hangers-on love the lifestyle that he provides for them. And Walt needs him because he's the one partner that he can trust. So these people provide an outside influence on him, dragging him back into the life that, you know, that he once had rather than the life he wants to pursue. The final one is, is flaws. And what I mean by a flaw is a moral fault. This is where you're not just hurting yourself, you're hurting others. Again, going back to Rick Blaine and Casablanca, he didn't just get his heart broken. What's happened now is he's become hard and cruel and indifferent. And when the Peter Laurie character, Ugardi, is shot in his, his casino, somebody says, I hope when they come for me, you just don't stand there. And he replies, I stick my neck out for nobody. Well, how did this guy who was so loving in the beginning, 
How is this guy who once fought for the underdog in Spain and Ethiopia, how has he become such a bitter, hard human being? Well, it's because that, that, that wound turned him cynical. And now he's become, it's, it's turned into a flaw. And this is an important point. Very often, these elements of limitation affect each other. They influence each other. They enhance or even create each other. Another example in November Road by Lou Burney, a book I highly recommend. It was a wonderful book, came out a couple of years ago. Charlotte Roy is his main character. When she's 13, she's a really strong swimmer. And all the parents, whenever they go down to the river to swim, the parents always say, you know, don't go too far out. The current is too strong. But she's the one who's capable of getting all the way across. And when she does, she goes into the high grass on the far river bank. And she lies there and looks up into, into the sky. And she dreams about the life she wants to live. And she wants to live in Chicago or New York or Los Angeles, some big city. And she wants to be a photographer. She wants to be a famous photographer. And, and this, is, this is, it just is the, her, her dream of life who she wants to be and how she wants to live. But then at 13, her father, who's only 35, suffers a sudden heart attack. There's the wound. And suddenly she realizes, as Lou puts it in the book, that life has cross currents that you can't predict. And her mother becomes incredibly protective to the point where she doesn't want her daughter to take any risks whatsoever because she can't afford to lose her. And Charlotte begins to, uh, to internalize that sense of, no, don't take risks, you know, stay safe. So the wound has created a sense of that anything can happen anytime. And that creates a fear of what she might do if she tries to really spread her wings. Her mother creates the, the, the sense of, yes, risk taking is dangerous. Um, don't do that, be safe. So when she's 17 and gets early admission to University of Oklahoma, within six weeks, she's so overwhelmed. She packs her bags and goes back to Little Weatherford, Oklahoma. And then when our story begins, she's now she's in her 30s. She's a mom married to a, an alcoholic with two girls. And she's colorizing photographs of wedding photographs, graduation photographs for the, the, the family photographer in Weatherford. That's how her dream of life has shrunk. And then something happens and she realizes, I can't live this way anymore. And that's what the story is about, what she decides to do about it and where she goes to accomplish that. So there it was a wound and a sense of opposition from the mother, a, a reinforcing sense of negativity that created a lack of confidence that held her back and prevented her from pursuing what she truly wanted. So that's how these forces can work and interact with each other. And very often that's exactly what they do. And very often it's a very organic thing. And we'll find that out now as we, um, I'm, if you've got the, the, the handout, this is page two. Where do we look in the character's past for how these things came about? And I learned this from a screenwriter named Gil Dennis. He, in particular, one of his, his probably his most famous screen, uh, uh, screenplay was for the Johnny Cash biopic, Walk the Line. And it was, uh, he, he did a workshop uh, at the Squaw Valley Writers Conference and I took part in it. But he did the same thing with Johnny Cash and he asked three questions. He said, what was your main moment of greatest sorrow? And Johnny Cash said, it was my brother died when I was nine. What was your moment of greatest shame? It was when I hit the kids. It was when I hit June in front of the kids. What was your moment of greatest joy? It's when the entire family played together at the Grand Ole Opry. And, and Gil said, this gave me two things. One, it gave me an arc. And it, two, it defined for me the theme of Johnny's life, which is family. What was the moment of greatest loss? When he lost his brother. Why? His brother was the one person in the family he could connect with. His father was overbearing, cruel, punitive, and the mother supported the father. So that's why he pursued a life of, of singing, fame. The family he wanted, he got from the audience. Well, of course, that's going to be incomplete. So he meets June, who can actually give him a real family. But because of that underlying sense of, of pain, a sense of, of, of inauth, uh, inauth, he's inauthentic because he's trying to get what he wants from others rather than the people really in his circle of life. And he lashes out. And that's his bottom when he realizes uh, when, when he does that and he feels that profound shame, he realizes I have to change. 
And that's when he accepts religion because June was very religious. The Carter family was famous in gospel circles. He turns to Jesus, he turns to Christ, becomes religious and ultimately reconnects with his family and is able to experience the moment of joy he has at the end of the story. So what were those moments? Gil said, I always look for moments of helplessness in the character's past. That moment of greatest pain. Another one, moment of greatest fear. Moment of greatest shame. Moment of greatest guilt. Now guilt, I, I differenti differentiate guilt from shame. Shame is when you do something that lessens your sense of, of worth in the eyes of others. They think less of you because of what you did. Guilt is when you harm someone. And the thing is, guilt can be forgiven. Shame is very hard to overcome because you, it's very difficult to change other people's minds once they form an opinion of you. There's an Irish saying, better the trouble that follows death than the trouble that follows shame. So, or moment of greatest betrayal. And that's, I, I started using that just in the last couple of books because what's gonna be important in almost every story? Who can I trust? Who can your character trust? Because they're gonna need allies. They're gonna need other people to help them. Well, what's their history of trust? Have they ever been profoundly betrayed? Well, if they have, how are they gonna overcome that, that suspicion and be able to trust in the course of your story? That's gonna be a key moment in your story. And then moment of greatest loss or moment of greatest sorrow. Who have they lost in their life that profoundly affected their sense of self and their sense of worth and their sense of promise? Okay, those are all the, the, the bad things that can happen. Moments of helplessness, where something terrible happened and they were sort of frozen in time. They didn't know how to react and it created an incredible sense of the, the earth coming undone beneath them. Well, that can also happen in a positive way. Those of you who've ever like suddenly acted impulsively in a moment where courage was required, know that you didn't think about it. You just sort of jumped in. Well, that, that shows something about your character. Or maybe you were a kind of person in a moment of fear, you ran and that shows you who you are. But that was a moment of helplessness where a deeper sense of your sense of yourself and character was revealed. So just as you look at your moment of greatest fear, what was your character's moment of greatest cowardice? I mean, of courage, excuse me. And just as you look at guilt or harm, what was their, their moment of greatest forgiveness? Either they forgave somebody or somebody forgave them. It's an incredible moment of grace. It's like, you know, you can't, that great song, you know, I can't make you love me. I can't make you forgive me. You know, I, I can do all sorts of penance, but the actual act of forgiveness is in your hands, not mine. So when someone does that for you, it's an incredibly profound moment in, in anybody's life. Shame. What's happened to shame? Pride. I was thinking, what is your character's golden moment? When they felt like they'd really accomplished what they set out to do, and it really defined them in a way that they really hoped would mean they were on the right path to who they wanted to be. Whether it's graduation from high school, graduation from law school, you know, that first job, the, the, the ascension to the, the, the presidency, whatever it was, you know, their, the, their first time they became a bestseller, you know, when they got to work on the TV show or their dreams, whatever it was, you know, that, that golden moment. Well, how do they feel about it? You know, own it, feel it strongly. Get a sense of it intuitively and emotionally. If you're going to look at betrayal, look at trust. When did they trust someone and it panned out? When did someone trust them and gave them that sense that they were worth, they were trustworthy? And if you're going to look at, you know, among the great loss, what a moment of great love, connection, joy. Now I'm doing these back and forth. But just like, you know, I, I mentioned Gil Dennis, sometimes you don't need to do all of these. And sometimes it's a waste of time. And sometimes it just clutters the things up. Gil would always pick three. And there's something magic about the number three. You know, maybe moment of greatest, as he did, moment of greatest loss, moment of greatest shame, moment of greatest joy. And you can explore this in terms of backstory, or you can use it to create your story. It depends on how you want to do it. If you want that moment of greatest story to be within the story, then they're going to have to work toward it. That fear and that shame are going to be what they're trying to overcome. If you want that moment of greatest joy to be in the past, then they're either going to try to recreate it 
or find something else that either equals it or surpasses it in the course of your story. Or if your story you know, ends in tragically, that, it, that moment of loss or betrayal is, is going to be something that they may have tried to avoid only to repeat. Some of the most wonderful stories are about somebody who suffered from some terrible event in their life and have been premising their entire life on avoiding it, only to find at the end, all they've done is, is, is dig a hole right back to it. So when you're trying to figure out how to look at your character's past, to determine the things that will define what they dream of, and what is holding them back, it's moments of helplessness that'll find, that'll be the way for you to find your path to those things. Now, we're kind of getting close to the end. They, there's more on the handout about how you turn those moments of helplessness into behavior. And I'm a firm believer in backstory is behavior. Again, going to Casablanca, we're not, we don't, under, we don't know the backstory till the middle of the movie, but we see it in how the Bogart character behaves. We see him being kind to his workers and being cruel and indifferent to strangers and in particular women who may want something from him. This girl is in love with him. He treats her terribly because he wants nothing to do with that. What's that about? And that creates suspense. When we see these contradictions that a character has both good and bad because of you know, who they've been, there's a sense of promise to who he might be and how his, his employees uh, look at him, but also a sense of this guy could be really dark. Um, which way is he going to go in the story? Well, looking to his past is the way to figure out how it is, but embedding it in his behavior is the way to show it and figure out ways that however, whatever moment of fear formed him or whatever moment of shame, how did that, how did his reaction to that become a habit of behavior that he has carried into his life to the beginning of your story? Okay, that's enough for now. I think it's time for some questions. Wow. Um, yeah, everybody, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, you know, as I was going through listening to you, David, I mean, I'm always amazed <laughs> when I when I hear you speak. I'm like, you know, you, you are present things so clearly. Um, and I think when I we initially talked about what I was hoping you would talk about, which was motivation, I think that's where a lot of great stories fall short, you know, stories, plots that have a great plot, but maybe lack depth and uh, character understanding is uh, the understanding of what drives the character. So as, as you were talking about, uh, I mean, I think the first thing is, do you have it clear in your mind as an author, um, what is driving your character? Um, and, and you talked a little bit about showing motivation through behavior. Are there tricks to um, doing this in uh, subtle ways or nuanced ways um, as, as a writer to make to get all these huge emotions onto the page? Well, I, the, the, the techniques, the, I guess, is a better a little technique. And just what, always ask yourself, OK, so this is who my character is. This is how they feel. This is what's happened to them. OK, so now in this moment, what would they do? Given that, what would they do? And there's a. Um, uh, I'm gonna to toot somebody else's horn here. Stephen James's Story Trump's Structure is a marvelous book. It's one of the few writing books that changed how I write, even after I'd written like, I think four novels by the time I read that book. And what he talks about is the beginning of every scene. Ask yourself, what would the character normally do, naturally do, given what just happened? What's the most natural thing that they would pursue? Because if you don't honor that, it's going to seem contrived. But if you just do that, it's going to become predictable. The rest of the scene is going to be foreseen. So how can you, given that natural response, how can you make whatever the problem is in that scene worse? I, I have a little thing on my computer, make it worse. <laughs> make the problem worse. And then you have to end the scene with a sense of surprise. That whatever happened at the end of the scene, and this is the hardest part of writing, is the ending has to be both logical, meaning foreseeable, but also surprising. When it happens, even though it's surprising, the reader goes, of course. That's that, that, given what happened. And the way you get there, start with the natural, make it worse, 
and force the character to make a decision they probably wouldn't have made at the beginning of the scene or sequence of scenes. If there's a okay. trick or a technique, that would be it. Okay. And are there um, any, uh, I mean, is there such thing as too much motivation, too much emotion or too much character? And how do you know how much is enough that isn't slowing down the story? I don't, well, I can say that, you know, doing too much work on your character's backstory is just a creative form of writer's block. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, working too much on their past instead of the present of the story is just a way of not writing the story. You've got to just get in there and figure out what your story is and launch them into it and get them going. You may have to circle back and say, well, wait a minute, I'm stuck. Why would my character be here? How did we get here? What would my character do next? And you may have to then stop and just say, okay, let's get back to my character. A lot of times you, you have to do some of this work as you're going along. Um, and like I said, how much is too much? If you did all of those moments of helplessness I talked about, I'd probably be too much. Uh, with one of my characters, the moment of greatest shame, betrayal and loss were all the same moment. It was a devastating, uh, it was in the Doc Holiday book. And it's when um, uh, Lisa, you know, the senior, the senior prom, when, you know, she goes out with her friends, gets completely drunk, you know, in a hotel room, wakes up uh, naked, realizes she's had sex with at least three people in the room, but has a very vague memory of it, S finds her dress, sees there's vomit down the front, but doesn't know if it's hers or not and then has to call her sister to come pick her up because she spent all her money on the taxi cabs for everybody to come over. So she has to trust her sister. Her sister betrays her and turns her into her dad and her dad never really speaks to her again. And so that moment of loss, betrayal and shame are all combined and it's, and it's, and it's shattering because it really does change her life. She never, she never once again becomes a true member of the family. But she hasn't given up on that. She, what she does is her reaction to that, her behavior, she falls in love with an older man. But what's that about? She's still trying to get her dad to see her. Mm -hmm. That's how I used it. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, there are some other questions too, and we'll get to those. But um, since uh, I'm not muted, I, I get to ask this question. So in the letters that um, Doc Holliday um, the, the letters that you created um, from Doc Holliday to his cousin. Um, can you talk a little bit? Can you talk a little bit about Doc Holliday as, as the character when you were, um, even though he was a past character and that novel is set in the present and in the past, how did you come up with the motivations and and the content of the letters and the relationships that he had? Well, the main the main relationship is that between him and his cousin Maddie. Maddie, see, look, my name is Maddie, and I keep calling her Mercy. Well, um, Maddie was the inspiration uh, for the character Melanie in Gone with the Wind, because Margaret Mitchell was a member of the extended holiday family, and Maddie became a nun. And if you remember, you know, Gone with the Wind, Melanie is very nun-like. She's, you know, everybody, you know, she's the good one. She's and and Maddie very much was that person, but. She had a special relationship with Doc when they were teenagers, and they wrote to each other throughout their lives. And uh, when Doc died, his letters were sent back to her. But because of the scandal, because they were a Southern family, and the scandal associated with Doc, she couldn't go down to pick up his belongings. She had to send her, uh, her father, you know, the uncle, to go down and pick them up for her. So she had both his letters and hers, because he got hers back from his, his effects. So she had this great collection of these letters. And the suspicion always was that they were actually lovers, that he had, you know, he had longed for her in his, his entire life. And the family poo-pooed this as, no, they were just close friends. Well, then why did she burn them before she died? Why did she destroy them? You know, I mean, who, whose scandal was she trying to spare? So with that, I just asked, well, what if they, you know, what if? What if they were love letters? And what if they weren't destroyed? What if that, that was just a lie? She claimed she destroyed them, but in truth, entrusted them to somebody else with the understanding they wouldn't be revealed until after this generation had died. But then 
That was in the 1930s, then you had the depression, blah, blah, blah. So for motivation of, 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 of Doc, I mean, as a writer, what do you do? You go for the strongest thing. Well, what's the strongest thing? A romantic connection. No, they were love letters, which is why it's the long lost love letters of Doc Holliday. And what was he trying to do? I mean, he had, he had to leave. And there's different stories of why he left. It was supposedly for his health. Well, that's nonsense because he went to Dallas. And if you're suffering tuberculosis, the one place you wouldn't go would be Dallas. It's just as humid. It's just as awful. The streets were full of, of excrement. And it was just, it was a terrible place to go if you're going for your health. Chances are he was escaping some sense of scandal. But also he once said to somebody else that a woman broke his heart. Okay, then validation for the whole love that what he was doing when he went to Dallas one of the first things he did is he joined a temperance society he was trying to, to sober up he's trying to get clean and sober feeling that if he did that maybe she would you know she would agree to marry him but here was her problem she was catholic and he wasn't and she wanted him to convert to catholicism his mother on her deathbed converted to Methodism from Presbyterianism. I don't know if you know anything about Pro Protestant theology. Presbyterianism is very Calvinist. It's very punitive. You know, you're, there's nothing you can do in your life. It's already been determined whether you're going to heaven or hell. Your character is set. And it's only the grace of God by which you go to one or the other. Well, Methodism is a much more benign, you know, Deeds, not creeds, is one of the little slogans of the religion. And his mother didn't want him to live his life the way his father would have, father's religion would have dictated, which is your, your acts are meaningless. She converted precisely to give him a sense of promise. Well, then why can't Maddie convert? Why couldn't she? Well, she's just bone, just to the bone Catholic and can't do that. So he's constantly trying to say, you know, it, it's a proof of love. So much of letters, if you look at love letters from the, uh, the middle of the 19th century, when women were finally able to meet men without a chaperone, many of the communications between men and women were about proof of love. Prove to me that you will not hurt me. Prove to me that you won't desert me. And so what he's trying to do is prove to her that, no, you know, if you come and join me, we can live together, but we can't back there. They'll never accept us. But if you come to me, and she's constantly saying, no, you're ill. You need to be with your family. This is the bed of love where you need. So the, all those letters, the motivations were, you know, terms of love. Come to me on my terms. Or no, no, come to me on my terms. Until ultimately, she realized he was never coming home. She gave up on that romantic relationship and decided to enter the convent. So that was the, that was the sort of motivational romantic theme behind the letters. Such a great, everybody, if you can, it's a great book. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, let's see, Deb, Debbie says, how do you decide, okay, how much backstory to initiate uh, with your characters at the beginning of the story? You mean, um, how much to show at the beginning? How yeah. much, well, here's a, how much to tell at the beginning is as little as possible that, you know, I mean, um, what you want to do is show it. You want to show it in their behavior. And this is where you have to think it through. Given what happened to them in the past, the most these moments of helplessness, how is that shaped how they behave? And that means how do they view themselves? And how do they view their place in the world? How do they view the world? Is the world a fair place? Is it an unjust place? Is it a cruel place? Is it indifferent? You can make your own way depending on your own skills. Given what happened to them, how do they view themselves and the world and their place in it? and then show that in how they act, how they think, how they interact with others, and how they talk, what they want and why they want it, or how they tell themselves they want it. They may change in the course of your story. So make try as much as possible embedded in behavior. Don't explain it until later. Remember when I, I used Casablanca as an example, and it's a classic. And in most, most films, you'll see that if backstory is presented, it's either presented in little bits when the character is in a moment of reflection or doubt, or in the middle, when some great reversal or reveal has happened, it changes the character's idea of where he is and where he's at, and he needs to adapt to that. And he reflects on his past to figure out, oh, right, given who I know, what I know of myself and my own past, where do I go from here? 
is that mo that inner moment of, of revelation or uh, reaction will have changed their idea of what was going on up till then. And to figure out how to go from there, they've got to reflect deeply. And that usually means looking at themselves uh, and how they got there, including all the way back into their past. Okay. And I think this uh, question also correlates a little bit to that. Um, say the character feels a great loss. This is from Richard. Um, how would David let the reader find out about um, the loss? Uh, is it best to have internal dialogue explained to the reader, or is it best to have the reader guess the loss felt by the character from the character's action? There's, there's no absolute answer to that. Um, uh, if you're a genius like John le Carre, you can narrate your way to oblivion, and just because your writing is so beautiful and the characters are fascinating, it's engaging. Um, it's usually, especially if you're beginning, it's best as much as possible to use scenes to externalize what characters think and what they feel. In other words, you give them someone to talk to, give them someone, you know, someone that they need to explain it to. And as much as possible, reveal through conflict. They're not just bearing their soul. They're having to justify themselves or explain themselves to somebody else who disagrees or who doubts or who it otherwise challenges them and forces them to have to explain themselves in a way that creates tension within the scene. That's usually the best way to bring these things out. Another way to do it is when you're building scenes one after the other into a sequence and it reaches a sort of climactic moment where something dramatically happens that changes um, the course of the story. The character now has a new understanding of what's going on or, um, through a, a revelation they didn't see coming, or there's been a great reversal where whatever opponent, whatever source of conflict has had a momentary victory, casting doubt on whether the, on, on, to the character on whether what they're doing is right, whether they're doing it the right way, whether it's meaningful, whether they should stop, turn around, surrender. And at a moment like that, that's that devastating, you have what's usually known as a sequel scene. And in a sequel scene, the character, first of all, registers the emotional impact of what's happened. Is it fear? Is it confusion? Um, is it a, a strengthening love bond for the other people that, that, they're, that they need to protect? What is the emotion that has been aroused uh, and elicited by whatever has just happened? Next, they explore the logic of it. How did it happen? Why didn't I see that coming? What does that mean? What does it mean about me? Why didn't I see it coming? What does it mean about the world? The world's clearly different than I thought. Things are happening that I didn't foresee. What's that mean? So emotion, logic, and then a plan, given that logic, given that emotion, a plan for going forward. And this is what the character thinks through as they're trying to figure out where to go from here. And the sequel scene is there both for the characters who are, you know, responding to this dramatic moment, but also the reader who's also responding. This gives the reader a chance to sort of um, not just identify with the characters, but also process their own emotional reaction to what has happened and their own logical understanding of what has happened. But you'll do it sort of in parallel with the character. Uh, um, Don Moss goes into this in really great detail uh, in the the emotional how to, is it how to write the emotional novel or something, yeah. something like that? Yeah, the emotional craft of novel writing or something right. like that. I forget. Um, which is a wonderful book. And um, this very often is also a place where the character can reflect on, you know, uh, I this moment, um, I understand this moment, or I the, my way of understanding this moment is by remembering how I dealt with something similar in the past. You know, I just, uh, somebody I care about was just endangered because of my actions. Well, guess what? This isn't the first time that happened. That happened before. Am I going to allow it to, to, to am I allow, going to allow myself to respond to it the same way I did, or will I do differently this time? That's how to bring the past into the present, is to, pre is to sort of create an echo moment. One that, that is similar to but usually worse than the one from the past. Well, how is your character going to deal with it now? 
Okay. And then um, Renee has, I'm looking for resources for weaving three central characters. Well, that's interesting. When you have multiple characters, they each have to have their own motivation, correct? Right. Okay. 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 So um, how, do, how do you handle motivation when you have three characters and, <clears throat> you know, not all of them, well, I guess you have to decide, are they prime? Can you have three primary characters? Is that? A I think, well, um, one of the novelists who inspired me was uh, Robert Stone. And he almost always had three characters um, working sort of in parallel. And their paths began to intersect only as the story emerged. So you could say that there were three main characters, but there was almost always one main, you know, one character who took preeminence, who really did sort of define sort of the, the moral premise of the story or who changed the most or who the reader empathizes with the most. And that's usually, you know, answering those questions will tell you, yeah, actually I do have a main character. I have two other main characters, but I have a, you know, a, a protagonist who really does carry most of the water of my story, given what I'm trying to say in the story. Given what, when the, when the story is over, what do I want the reader to carry away from it? Well, which of those three characters conveys that most in, a, in the most personal way, I think would be one way to do it. Um, you don't need to do that. You can have your three main characters, but if you're gonna do that, yeah, then you have to do your, your, you have to do really big homework on all of them, major homework that explores all of this that I've just described. And that's gonna be somewhat unwieldy, um, but if you want to do it, you know, go with God. It, you, you wouldn't be the first, and it's you know certainly um, that that's always wonderful grist for a really big, you know, meaty novel. But then remember that that to make it work, they're going to have those whatever their motivations and ambitions uh, are. They're going to have to clash, and and you. There's the only way to figure out how that can happen and why that would happen is to do the kind of deep character work that we're talking about here. You know, why why not cooperate? You know, why not get along? Well, because my dream of life is fundamentally different than that character's dream of life. Well, can they find a compromise or is there no way to compromise? These are the questions that will be answered when you do your deeper character work. Okay, great. Okay, and then Richard has another question. In a murder slash mystery, the reader will gain um, through understanding the antagonist's feeling of loss, not the protagonist's loss. Do you agree with that? I'm not sure I understand it. Um, okay. and the antagonist in, in a murder mystery is the killer. The, the antagonist, right? That would be, the, be the killer in a murder Right, so, so it, um, the, does the reader, reader gain understanding through the antagonist's feeling of loss? Or, or the protagonist's feeling of loss? Well, I, I, guess. Mystery, I, I would say in a murder mystery, um, first of all, you, the detective, their yearning is, doesn't have to do with a sense of loss. It usually has a sense of what's known as the will to justice. Now that may be rooted in a sense of loss that they lost someone in their past. And that, you know, for example, um, Harry Bosch, his mother was murdered. Um, she was a prostitute. Nobody cared. And his, what happened? He, be, he developed a code. You know, everybody matters or nobody matters. And so that sense of loss motivates him. Now, the killer, it depends on how deeply you want to go into why the killer killed the person they did. And, you know, if you, you can go into their backstory, for example, Red Dragon goes extensively into, um, Oh God, his name is escaping right now. I'll talk about this in Compass of Character. There's a whole chapter on villains. And if you want to go into the backstory, uh, Francis Dollarhide is his name. And Thomas Harris goes deeply into the terrible events of his childhood, the abuse he suffered, and how that sort of explains his sense of vengeance that motivates his killing. But also his need for connection because he actually falls in love with one of his would-be victims who's blind, who can't see, you know, as it were, can't see who he really is. And so he's capable, he believes, of being loved by her. Um, so, and that's really, really effective. But there are other, you know, killers who really are just sort of, they're just monsters. 
and depending and that the pleasure of the book at the end is seeing the monster destroyed that they're so hideous and so relentless and so clear in their motivation to create havoc and chaos and pain that the reader is is not going to want to see them humanized. They're gonna to want to see them destroyed and only in their destruction can a sense of catharsis at the end of the book happen. So it depends on how you wanna do your book, what kind of villain you want and what kind of emotional and moral payoff you want at the end. Okay, all right. And we have, um, let's see, one, one more question. Um, can you speak to blending setting with character quality without setting becoming a character? I, first of all, I. This whole idea that setting becoming a character, I, 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 I just think it is overly cute. I mean, setting is, setting can certainly affect a character and setting can be as interesting as your characters, but setting doesn't have agency. And that's what characters have. So the whole idea of setting as a character fundamentally betrays the real difference between them. However, setting can be used to explore character. And very often when I'm, I'm writing my plot, of, I mean, I'm teaching my plot of character course through Lit Reactor, which is coming up actually in October, if anybody would like to join, uh, go, you can either go to my website or go to Lit Reactor, and that's all one word, L-I-T-R-E-A-C-T-O-R. And this upcoming course is the character of plot, where I teach how to build your plot from character. And part of that is understanding, you know, well, how do I use setting? And one of the questions you'll ask is, well, how do I condense the world into what's known as the arena, which is the smallest element of my setting I need to tell my story? And what, will that, what does that setting need to include? And it needs to portray how people pursue what they want in my story world. Who has power, who doesn't? Who gets what they want? Who has to settle for less? Why? Uh, and then the character, you can either have the character go from point A to point B, or they can traverse the various parts of the story world to explore it. And why does the character have to do that? This is um, Richard Price, who's a, uh, another writer I really love. He usually starts with a place he wants to explore. He starts with the setting, like the Lower East Side or the projects, uh, the projects in, in, in Clockers, the Lower East Side and Lush Life. And he says, if you want to explore someplace, put a dead body in it and a motivated detective who's got to go and talk to everybody to figure out what happened. So you can use sometimes a murder mystery. If setting's really your fascination, you can use the detective mystery to explore it. Or any, what you, any need that the main character will, will have to go to various places within your setting. If what you're trying to do is, 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 is reveal that setting, uh, you can do that through the character's need to find things out about it. And then how does that change the character? What, you know, in people say, well, do every, does every character have to change? Well, every story is a learning experience. And to learn is to grow and to grow is to change. So giving your character a need to learn things from the setting so that they can solve the problem at the core of the story is one of the fundamental ways of creating an engine for character change because that learning, creating the growth that comes with it. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but um, that's my fun fundamental understanding of the interaction between character and setting. I, I think uh, everyone will agree with me. You're, we're trying to write down everything you say, even though we know you have a handout because you don't want to miss a word because everything is so, it, it like opens your mind and is so nuanced. So um, I'm glad that this is recorded, but, um, you have the two books out. Let's talk about, you've been really generous about talking about motivation of character and we, we want to learn more. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between um, the art of character and um, the compass of character? And uh, if you're looking for something in particular, which book might be better for you? Um, well, the art of character is what I, I, when I wrote it, I said, this thing is a toolbox. You know, you don't want to read it. Well, you can if you want, but reading it cover to cover might be overwhelming. It's more a case of, okay, um, I, I really need to work on my scenes and how characters work in scenes. There's a whole chapter on that. There's a chapter on dialogue. There's a, uh, a chapter on, um, on backstory and what to explore. 
And so it's really, it, it, it was meant to be the comprehensive book about character. And of course, once you begin teaching, I, I said this to Don Moss, I said, the thing is, once I start teaching from it, I kind of go, oh yeah, wait, you know, but I could really explore that a little bit better. And he says, that's why you teach before you write the book. Um, so, and the thing that I, that, that became apparent to me was that uh, there's a whole book, you know, a whole section on desire, but I realized just how nuanced writing about desire was. And that's what composite character is about. It's about motivation specifically. It's about the layering of the exterior goals with the internal and interpersonal and linking the outer objective to the inner need and the various ways you can go about that. So it's specific in that, in terms of motivation and showing how a character accomplishes what they believe they need in a story. Whereas art of character is sort of a nuts and bolts, you know, everything you might need. It's the kind of thing you keep by your desk going, going uh, I'm not sure about, well, let's see, what, what does Corbett have to say about this and how much do I disagree with him? And, uh, and so that, that's how I would use the two different books. Okay. All right, great. Well, um, I hope everybody enjoyed um, today as much as uh, I did. We'll give every um, polite golf applause to David. Zoom <laughs> applause. Um, thank, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your expertise um, and your wisdom. And we hope that you'll come back. Uh, I mean, I think everybody would agree that we could sit here and listen to you for another hour and a half and not even think about anything else but what you're saying. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate it. I hope if you are like me and you'll want to watch this again, uh, it will be on our members only in the Facebook page. And eventually after it's edited and packaged, um, probably in a month or so, it will be on our YouTube channel, SCWA Writers Online. Um, also, if you can't wait, I would highly suggest you buy David's books. Um, I have them by um, my, on my desk, actually. Um, so which, which, which you have, which you right presently can't find. Yeah. I mean, well, that one, but this one, and I told David, you know, I read it because I have my, my markers in it. Um, and my lack of organization has, is no reflection on David's books. So, um, <laughs> so, um, I want to, um, thank you all, um, for being here, David, for being here. Uh, well, I hope you have a great month. Uh, we have a great speaker next month. Uh, who's coming in, um, just a little note, Andy Bartz, who was with us, Andrea Bartz, who was with us last month, just signed a Netflix deal, movie deal for uh, We Were Never Here, which was her latest book that she talked a little bit about last month. So good for Andy Bartz um, and good for us. And thank you again, keep writing and we will see you next month.